Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the British School and to the third lecture in our series accompanying the annual master's course in the topography and archaeology of the city of Rome. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome my fellow course tutor and this year's BSR Rome scholar, Alice Poletto. Alice studied archaeology at La Sapienza here in Rome before moving on to Oxford, where she wrote her defilled thesis on the functions and usage patterns of post-Hadrianic imperial villas in Italy under the supervision of Janet Delane. Her fellowship at the BSR has extended and amplified this theme, concentrating on maritime villas and especially their role as ports on the route between Africa and Rome, as we shall hear tonight. Alice also has a great deal of experience in the field, having excavated on the Palatine with Clementina Panella, at Hadrian's Villa with the Columbia University project, and in Turkey, Morocco, and Kosovo. Already this year, she's been extremely busy at Portus, Ostia, and Civitavecchia, and all of us on the MA course are very fortunate to be able to share her knowledge of imperial architecture and topography. So we're in expert hands for tonight's lecture, which is being recorded. And just to remind you, uh, online viewers can join in the discussion afterwards by sending questions using the Q&A function on their screens. So would you now please welcome Alice Poletto and dispatching the dole, the seaborne transport of staples between Tunisia and Italy through literary and archeological evidence. Thank you, Robert. Thanks everyone for being here. And most importantly, my uh, greatest acknowledgements to the BSR for making this project possible. This is a project that, uh, as Robert mentioned, originates and probably stems from the results of my doctoral thesis, which concentrating on post Hadrianic villas. But of course, as part of the data collection process, I had the opportunity to notice a number of features and details in particular that prompted me to investigate the subject in further detail. Um, the, from the title, the uh, subject of today's talk seems quite broad, and in fact I want you uh, to be uh, absolutely fine about the fact that it won't be a, a two hours lecture. The uh, archaeological evidence that we will be looking at is mostly the distribution map of a number of imperial villas on the coast of uh, northern Lazio and southern Tuscany, and uh, to a, a smaller extent, the configuration of the harbor facilities of three of them. Uh, we won't uh, be discussing uh, ceramics and we won't be discussing inscription uh, at any rate. The idea is to have a look at the logistics uh, that were connected to the transport of the doll, and most importantly, to understand how the uh, involvement of the Roman state uh, was uh, concretized in the coordination of a number of the individual efforts uh, that happened at multiple uh, scales, uh, at, a local fact, uh, at, at a local scale and at a global scale. And in fact, I, I also uh, take the opportunity for, um, to thank the, the organizers of a workshop into which I presented part of my research two months ago on globalization that uh, dealt a lot with the combination of global and local factors um, in the ancient world. Uh, to start with, we will have a look at what Anona, or what Anona was and how it developed uh, throughout the uh, Republican and the early imperial period. Uh, we will also uh, have a look at uh, the extent uh, at which the Roman state was involved and in how uh, systematically the Anona was organized by the Roman state at different times. Uh, we will not look at the whole imperial period because the time frame that is most interesting to this paper is the Trajanic period. So we will analyze the Republican period, uh, look at what happened in the early empire and stop at the Trajanic period. Uh, we will uh, briefly discuss how and why the seaborne why the seaborne transport of goods was preferred and how this was carried out uh, to move uh, to the maritime routes between Africa and Rome 
uh, as I mentioned, the, the paper focuses on uh, the transport of goods from Tunisia. So we will look at the routes that connected in particular Tunisia with Italy. And finally, we will look at the imperial villas I mentioned in my introduction that are all on the southern coast of, of uh, uh, ancient Etruria and uh, which are all characterized by disproportionately big harbor facilities and uh, what sort of support uh, they could have provided to the overall transport of grain. Uh, I would like to start with this sentence that does not refer to the Republican period at all. And in fact, it's uh, a sentence from a letter that Tiberius sent to the Senate in the year uh, 22 AD, in which um, it is made crystal clear that the responsibility of the grain supply is entirely the emperor's. Um, and if the emperor happens to neglect this responsibility, uh, the state, the whole state, will be in complete ruin. Uh, the letter was not really co much concerned with uh, famine and food shortage, uh, but rather with uh, extreme luxury of uh, the Roman aristocracy. Uh, and the, um, the, the, the reasons why Trajan needed to uh, call into question the importance of grain supply is that in case of necessity and in case of particular food shortage, the imperial authority could always resort on the possessions of on its own possession and on the luxury of its own possessions to feed the Roman people. Uh, the word anona uh, has the same root of the word annus year and refers to the uh, yearly amount of food that was uh, necessary to um, to feed the people. Uh, it is something that, uh, again, has been a concern of the Roman authorities uh, since uh, the earliest days of the Roman word for a number of reasons. Let us start with uh, the importance of grain and in particular of weight in the diet of the ancient word. Uh, this is a subject that has been addressed in detail by Geoffrey Rickman in his um, 1980s book, The Corn Supply of Ancient Rome, in which he explained uh, why grain was preferred to spelt uh, and to barley uh, as the main staple for the nutrition of the Roman people. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, not just the uh, high uh, calorific value of grain, but also the presence of gluten. Uh, the presence of gluten is necessary for the production of bread. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons why it's much better to uh, uh, organize people's nurture on bread rather than on sort of porridge or pulsum or, or polenta uh, is that the nutritious power of bread by volume is much higher than that of, of, uh, of barley. This may seem uh, unnecessarily detailed, but the uh, remark on calories has tight connections with the amount of grain that was distributed on a monthly and yearly basis uh, to Roman people. And in fact, uh, recent calculations have uh, uh, argued that the average um, amount of calories that a male adult needs to uh, sustain oneself throughout the day is between 3,300 and 3,500. And interestingly, uh, the amount, these amount of calories is provided exactly by the amount of weight that was provided by the Roman state as part of the, the grain dole. We'll go back to it. Um, grain was necessary, but one of the reasons why it was necessary to uh, guarantee a constant supply and a stable and reliable storage was that uh, a number of reasons could hinder the, uh, the stable and the, the reliable sources of the Roman state. Uh, vagaries of climate, to start with, uh, any sort of political troubles that could lead landowners to not be able to harvest uh, the grain over, over a year, uh, any sort of problems connected with transport, uh, and namely pirates, uh, with which Pompey, Pompey will have to deal uh, in the late Republican period. So there were a number of reasons why 
uh, it was necessary to uh, have a reliable stock of grain in the state of granaries and to take care not only of the reliable stock but also of the constant supplies. Uh, a factor that, of course, prompted the Roman authorities to uh, in, engage in uh, to engage deeply in providing a constant supply of grain was the huge, probably uh, to quote Robert, the ginormous expansion and growth of Roman populations uh, since uh, the late Republican period, and most importantly, uh, after the Punic Wars, all through the first and second centuries of the empire, uh, quantifying this, uh, the, the number of the Roman population in the late Republican period and in the, the imperial period has, uh, has received several attempts. Uh, normal uh, calculations are in the orders of magnitude of six or 700,000 up to uh, twice this amount. Uh, this is not in, is extremely relevant to what we are going uh, to do today because uh, we have information in the literary sources as to the actual and accurate number of people that were entitled to receive the grain door. Okay, um, the expansion of Rome, but also the problems connected with grain harvests led uh, Roman authorities to resort on first on neighboring areas and second on further regions to ensure the supply of grain. Uh, in the first, uh, in the earliest phases of the Roman Republic, grain was sought in the neighboring uh, Etruria and in the neighboring Campania, but things changed quite rapidly after the, the, the first Punic War and most importantly after the Annibalic Wars. Uh, as a result of which Rome acquired its first two provinces, namely Sicily and Sardinia. Um, if in the first instance, when Rome resorted on, on Campania and Etruria for its grain supply, this was organized as a sort of non-official grain trade, uh, mostly done through private merchants and private negotiatores or mercatores, when Sicily and Sardinia became provinces, the amount of grain that uh, was required from Rome was organized through the organization of, th of tithes, uh, that is fees that Rome levied uh, in the percentage of one th tenth of the annual of the yearly yield from these provinces. Uh, what we don't know is how actually this happened. We know that uh, these provinces had to uh, provide a certain amount of their yield to the central authorities, but we do not really know who was in charge of this, uh, how the yield was collected, how it was transported to the main shipping areas, and uh, who was responsible for this whole thing. Uh, we have evidence for the involvement of uh, private merchants in this process, and it's most likely, therefore, that uh, the Roman state provided the instructions and the regulations and probably the framework for the carrying out of the collection and the transport of grain, but left the, let, let's call it the, the donkey, the donkey job to private individuals. Things uh, started to get um, a little more stable uh, in the late Republican period, and in particular in the year 123 BC, with the first Lex Frumentaria promoted by Gaius Gracchus. Um, it's, this, this law is markedly different from what happened in later periods, in that the gray, it, it, uh, it, it uh, stated that a number of people were entitled to receive grain distribution at a subsidized price. And the importance of having to pay for grain distribution is one of the reasons why things changed sharply in the late Republic. So uh, not, uh, we do not know who exactly was entitled to receive these distributions. Probably it was reserved uh, to people with a uh, 
specifically poor income. But we do know that uh, there was necessary to have the domicilium in Rome to be entitled to receive the distribution. Uh, it is the first legal provision. And here we now go back to what I mentioned with regard to the calorific value of rain and to the importance of having a calorie intake of about 300 calories for May individuals. The amount of rain that uh, the Roman people was entitled to receive on a monthly basis was five modi. Uh, one modi ulna corresponds to about six and a half or seven kilos. And five modi for a month correspond to about 300 calories a day. So um, I highly doubt that in the ancient world, these accurate calculations were made with regard to how much people actually needed. But this is certainly the, uh, there is the evidence for the actual awareness of how important it was to feed the people. Um, we need to state, however, that this amount was a family amount and not an individual amount. So in fact, what uh, people actually had access to was a much lower amount of grain. Um, I mentioned the fact that the corn, uh, according to the, uh, to the Lex Sempronia, the corn was not distributed for free because things changed quite sharply in the year 58 BC with the Lex Claudia Frumentaria sponsored by the infamous Tribunus Claudius, uh, the one that had a big argument with Cicero, for, uh, as you guys will remember. Um, the, uh, things changed sharply because the Lex Claudia Frumentaria stated that those entitled to receive the door could receive it for free. Uh, and the major turnover that this implied was the fact that the grain suppliers acquired a key political importance as an instrument to influence the people of Rome. Uh, whoever could afford to provide uh, this amount of grain uh, was, uh, had a huge weapon in his hands to uh, influence uh, the people. And in fact, even uh, if it was officially stated only in the year 58 BC, it already was Sulla uh, around 80 BC that um, carried out free logicians of grain. But it, it became clear as the, uh, the population in Rome grew and as the, the, the turmoil caused by the civil war complicated the supply of grain and hindered the storage of grain, that it was necessarily to have a stable supply, a reliable supply, and it was not possible to resort on free logicians by prominent individuals. Uh, the problems caused not necessarily by the civil wars, but by pirates in the Mediterranean prompted the Senate to grant Pompey a special responsibility for the supply of grain in that he received the uh, full power on the supply of whey, the omnis potestas rei frumentarie tot urbe terrarum, for a period of five years. Uh, this, in a sense, follows a bit in the line of what we've been talking about with regard to Claudius, who sponsored the free donations of, of grain for political purposes. The fact of granting this responsibility to one single individual for such a long period uh, implied the risks of creating someone that could have been too influential on, on the masses and could acquire too much power than the whole Republican structure was able to endure. What we know, however, is that Pompey did not have any control on the state treasury and did not have any uh, any more power than all the other provincial governors. So his power was mostly connected to getting rid of pirates, which uh, in fact he did in about three months, and uh, organizing contracts and agreements with grain merchants. Uh, the importance of organizing contracts and agreements with grain merchants is something we will go back in a moment when we get to discuss what happened in the imperial period, because it was one of the main instruments through which the central power could so, uh, convince and encourage private individuals to engage 
in the transport of grain. Um, together with the, um, uh, again, the, these, uh, th this um, power, Pompey received uh, the power of, of getting rid of all the pirates. And uh, again, uh, the Senate was perfectly aware of how dangerous it was uh, to provide such, uh, uh, such a huge power to a single individual for such a long time. Um, again, neutral Moyle Caesar uh, stepped in and what he did foreshadows substantially what happened in the early empire. First, he carried out a recensus, that is a new calculation of the total amount of individuals that were actually entitled to receive the free distribution of grains and reduced this total to 200,000. Uh, beforehand, the, the, it had reached 320,000. So the responsibility of the Roman state in taking care of the needs of so many people had probably grown beyond what uh, it was uh, actually able to afford. Uh, he created two political figures called the Ediles Cereales in charge of uh, taking care probably of the distribution of weight in Rome. Uh, but most important, even more important than what he did, what was he did not have the time to do, but had planned. Uh, that is a new work in the harbor of Ostia that uh, was already probably showing its problems, probably connected with lack of uh, Wolfhard's page and with the risks of silting of the Tiber outlet. And also he had planned to excavate a channel that would connect Puteoli with Ostia and thus ensure a smoother and safer traffic of all the grain ships from Puteoli that was up until the age of Claudius, the main harbor for the transport and the, the ship of the grain trade. Uh, of course, what happens to Caesar is uh, known to the larger public and his plans remain plans. Uh, it's interesting the notes about what happened in the year 43 BC when the Senate issued a special decree that was meant to prevent one single individual to acquire the power of grain distribution in his sole hands. This was a decree evidently influenced by political concerns and concerns towards the concentration of too much power in the end of one single individual. We now move to the imperial period and we notice that uh, Augustus's deeds did have some influence and were probably uh, inspired by uh, not only by Caesar, but what the Senate had done in the past. Uh, he accepted the Cura None in the year 22 BC and appointed Tiberius uh, as his uh, Questor Ostiensis. This is probably uh, the first line in Tiberius's CV uh, in his path towards the full acquisition of power as emperor uh, several years later. Uh, this figure of the Questor Ostiensis is something that existed as early as the third century BC which and that was, however, originally concerned with the uh, military navy of Rome. Uh, with the uh, progressive uh, decrees of, of danger and the progressive de decrees, uh, decrees of a necessity of having a maritime navy, the duties of the quest on Ostiensis were rather concerned with the reception, with the storage, and the transshipment of the dole that was received from the provinces rather than with the army. Um, even if Caesar had already carried out a new calculation of the, the overall number of individuals that were entitled to receive the doll, this number had grown again to 320,000. To 320,000. And that it was necessary to Augustus to carry out a second recensus in the year 2 BC that reduced the number again to 200,000. And so much was he concerned about the risks of renting the responsibility of grain supply to someone else that he waited until the very final phase of his life to create uh, the key figure of 
grain supply in the empire, that is the Praefectus Annonae. Uh, we don't really know when exactly happened. It was sometimes with, between the years 8 and 14 AD. Uh, but not only is uh, evidence for his concerns was uh, giving too much power to one single person, but it also stands as evidence for Augustus' uh, concern about the survival of the grain supply system that he had developed and perfectioned after his death. So the Prefectus Annonae was uh, a newly created official of non-senatorial rank, of equestrian rank, and this is important to note because uh, it was meant to not give too much power to senators, and it probably had a permanent responsibility. Uh, as we can see, however, what Augustus did was rather connected to the distribution of grain uh, than with its supply, and its supply remained a problem. Uh, it remained a problem, and it uh, was not sold for uh, 30 years after his death, and the first emperor who uh, took serious and committed steps towards the, sol uh, the, the solution of this problem was Claudius, who began the works on Rome's new harbor in the year 42 AD after a massive food shortage in the year 41 had led the people to organize massive demonstrations uh, and to siege Claudius uh, in his own palace. Uh, we will see in a moment, actually we see it now, uh, this is uh, something with which most of us are familiar, but um, ignore this, this feature here that dates to a later view. What we need to focus on was the creation of this huge artificial basin with a, an anchorage surface of about 200 hectares to the north of the Tiber outlet that is here and to the north of Bostia uh, in an area where Claudius's consulars had always tried to discourage him to build a harbor, probably because of silting. And in fact, the problems of silting was uh, what prompted Trajan to improve uh, the, this basin. What is even more interesting than the configuration of the basin is, is this huge system of canals through which the harbor was connected to the Tiber so that the goods that arrived to Portus and that needed to reach Rome could be shipped directly to the Tiber and did not need to go to Ostia. Um, not only did Claudius engage in the construction of a new harbor, but as we uh, mentioned with regard to Pompey, he encouraged the progressive involvement of private individuals in the transport of grain from uh, the provinces to Rome. How did you do that? We do not have any evidence for legislations that compelled private merchants to support and help the grain supply. But what we do know is that benefits were granted to those who owned ships that could transport more than 10,000 modi in the form of exemptions from other public duties. Uh, this, systems, this system was maintained throughout the imperial period and uh, acquired completely different traits in the late empire to the point that the public duty for merchants became contribute and help with the organization of, uh, of the grain trade. Um, moving on, the Claudius, was murdered before he had the time to complete his harbor that was completed under Nero. Um, but already uh, in the year 62 AD, a, um, a sea storm caused probably by the unnecessary size of the, of the basin caused uh, up to 200 grain ship cargoes to be sunk. And uh, as a result, the complete loss of all the cargo. Uh, but what Nero did was not just completing uh, Claudius's harbor at the outlet of the Tiber, but rather concentrating in the ports to the south of Rome, and in particular to, uh, to the port of Antium, uh, which he enlarged, and that was probably meant to serve 
as a secondary harbour to support traffic from the south and from Puteoli. Puteoli, up to the Claudian, uh, to the, to the Claudian period, up to the construction of Portus at the outlet of the time, but Puteoli was the main hub for uh, the shipment and the uh, dispatch of the door to Rome. But it had a main problem in its connections to Ostia. Uh, the stretch of coastline from Putelu to Ostia is reported by Strabo to, be, to have been completely uh, aliminos, that is harborless, uh, that prompted Nero to engage into uh, different initiatives. The first, for which we still have evidence, is uh, the enhancement of the port of Antium, which he probably doubled in its size. Uh, the second, he only had the time to start, but uh, draws clear inspiration from uh, what Caesar had planned, that is the excavation of a fossa navigabili, a navigabilis, a canal between Puteoli and Ostia. Uh, recent uh, research, I think there's an article from 2015, have managed to uh, identify the evidence for the first phases of the excavation of this canal, but uh, as with his predecessor, Nero was killed before he had the time to complete the canal. We now move on to the period that uh, is most relevant to my paper, uh, that is the times of Trajan. Trajan, in a sense, and uh, not much, not really my opinion, but mostly in the opinion of Geoffrey Rickman and Wooden Sirks, uh, was a sort of watershed in the progressive definition of the Annona process in the imperial period, in the sense that he completed uh, what had has been done uh, in, had been done uh, either to by Claudius, by Augustus, by by Nero, and uh, set the main uh, framework for the the transport of grain uh, in the second and, and third centuries of the empire. Uh, as we mentioned before, he enhanced the, uh, the hub uh, of Portus with the construction of this hexagonal basin that has the main purpose of providing an additional shelter to ships anchored in the main one, uh, thus not only providing additional anchoring space and wharfing space, but also providing a safer space where ships could stay uh, in cases of uh, bad weather. Uh, he also enhanced the system of canals that connected Portus with the Tiber, and he um, expanded also the storage facilities of this harbor with uh, this uh, sequence of warehouses on all the sides of the hexagon. Uh, this hexagon is an absolute unicum in our evidence for the configuration of Roman ports because it doesn't exist at all. But the layout of Portus as it is provided the inspiration for the other of Trajan's uh, major port installation that is the port of Canton Caelle, Civita Vecchia, uh, about 70 kilometers to the northwest of Rome. Uh, here, uh, sorry for the low quality of this image, but it is under copyright. <laughs> and I had no chance at all to find a, a more decent one. But as we can see from this image, uh, the harbor of Civita Vecchia consists of an, an outer harbor and an inner harbor that sort of replicate the layout of Portus, where Claudius is, is the outer one and Trajan's is the inner one. Um, it's interesting because it's completely artificial. It exploits no natural features in, in this area of the coast. And it was maintained in its layout up until the final years of the 19th century when uh, it was the main port of uh, Rome's papal state. Uh, so we can get a clear sense of what it looked like from historical cartography. Uh, yeah, we, we mentioned already what Trajan did at Portus. Uh, we also have some evidence for work in uh, Rome's Tiber port, which I don't really have the time to discuss in detail here. Uh, and lastly, but not least, what Trajan did was organizing in further 
detail in, in a more structured way the system of contracts that the central authority had with private merchants and shippers uh, with the creation of corpora and collegia. Uh, in particular, it is worth to note uh, the creation of the corpora of the bakers, uh, the uh, pisto uh, pistores, and of the, the ship owners, the uh, naviculari, that were the state's main tool to control who was entitled to receive privileges. So the privileges were granted to those who were members of this, this collegia, this sort of uh, professional guilds. Um, after having, after this uh, not really brief overview of the history of uh, Nona uh, up until the times of Trajan, we now move to one of the sources of Rome's grain, uh, that is Africa. Uh, Africa be became a Roman province after the destruction of Carthage, and uh, through the transformation of Africa in a province, Rome inherited a, uh, an extremely sophisticated agricultural tradition, but also a structured and well-organized territory that was particularly suited uh, for further agricultural installation. And in fact, I wanted to show you, uh, this is from the Barrington Atlas, and you can see, can you see this squared grid here, here, all over the place? This is evidence for the centuriation, that is the, the, the reorganization of land for agricultural purposes. If we look at this area, we see that a really high percentage of the overall place had received centuriation. So much of the province of Africa had been devoted to agricultural purposes. Uh, the agricultural importance of Africa uh, did not escape uh, the Roman authorities. And in fact, uh, uh, already as early as Gaius Gracchus, a colony, an agricultural colony was founded in Carthage. This was, uh, a failed experiment because it did not have the uh, the colony did not have the chance uh, to last after the death uh, the murder of Gaius Gracchus. But it's not unlikely that the col the new colony that Caesar founded in the year forty six BC uh, could exploit the framework that had been defined by Gaius Gracchus. And in fact, Geoffrey Rickman has argued that Caesar's colony was not only meant to uh, provide landed estates to soldiers, but also to uh, promote and enhance the agricultural potential of Africa as Rome's granary. Uh, and in, in this sense, it's particularly interesting to note that the land ownership patterns in Africa uh, point towards this direction and are uh, probably one of the reasons why it was so easy for the central authorities to um, organize large shipments of grain from Africa to Rome. Uh, the land, uh, the large landed estates that were in the hands of senatorial landowners uh, progressively passed uh, in imperial possessions. Uh, there is um, a mention from one of Pliny's letters about uh, Nero acquiring up to six ex estates from six of the largest uh, landowners of Africa. And of course, Pliny exaggerates saying that with this acquisition, Nero had acquired half of Africa, but this gives us an extent of how big these properties were and how crucial it was for the Roman state to incorporate them in uh, its own possessions. Okay, it is uh, now time to move to the transport side of things, uh, starting with questions. Uh, namely, we don't really know how uh, grain reached ports from the production areas. Uh, we really have no idea because the only evidence we have dates back to the late empire, at least with uh, regard to Africa. We Africa. We know about the existence of a corpus uh, clabularius, 
that is a uh, an official state organized and state sponsored service for landed transport of grain uh, with uh, uh, ox with carts uh, towed by oxen. Uh, but what happened in the Republican period uh, es escapes uh, our understanding completely. What we do know, however, is that it was much more convenient to, to organize the shipping of grain uh, as seaborne transport rather than uh, as landborne transport uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, seaborne transport could be organized on sail ships that needed uh, virtually no fuel and thus were much cheaper uh, than oxen, cars, and the overall logistics of this sort of transport. Uh, and it also was much safer uh, if we ignore the dangers caused by uh, bad weather, pirates, and any sort of hazards connected to the sea. Uh, so cheaper and so much more convenient it was that uh, Again, Geoffrey Rickman highlighted that uh, it probably was better to organize the shipment of a grain load from one end to the other of the Mediterranean than to move it by just 100 miles by land. Uh, after it had uh, reached Italy, the grain needed to be unloaded and uh, to reach Rome. Even though uh, both the the harbor, both harbors and portals were quite deep. Uh, the size of fully loaded grain ship was way too big for that depth, and therefore the cargo had to be unloaded onto lighter ships and transported up to Rome, uh, upstream, with uh, particularly the fine ships called the Naves Caudicaria that were towed uh, by uh, humans or by oxen up to Rome. Um, this weird map that in a, in a way reminds of ski resort maps uh, is uh, taken from Pascal Arnaud's book on um, ancient sailing routes in, uh, in the Mediterranean and uh, gives us an idea of how interconnected the Mediterranean was and uh, how many options and alternatives were uh, available to reach one place for an from uh, another. What is interesting for the purpose of this talk is the three ports that I have marked with the orange squares, namely Tabaraka, Utica, and Carthage, uh, that, as we can see from the map, had a direct connection with Sardinia through these routes. Uh, Tabaraka, Utica, and Carthage, together with probably uh, Hippo, uh, Regius, and Rusicade, were the main collecting hubs for the grain uh, uh, harvested in Tunisia and where therefore uh, the areas where all the dole was brought together before being shipped to Rome. What are the evidence uh, or the pieces of evidence that we have for the existence of these routes? We don't have much, unfortunately, but in particular, for uh, the ultimate purpose of this paper, we have a precious source that is Caesar's Bellum Africum. Uh, the amount of time that was needed to reach uh, Sardinia from the coast of Northern Africa is uh, about two, uh, two and a half to three days, depending on a number of factors and uh, ultimately the speed of the vessel. Um, and the, um, the figures are provided uh, mostly in the, the source of uh, the late antique source called the Itinerario Maritimo Mantonini Augusti, uh, but also in Caesar's Bellum Africum. That uh, offers us a precious piece of evidence for the reconstruction of the final stretch that these ships, ships followed. Um, Okay, uh, here is the final sentence, the really final sentence of Caesar's Bellum Africum that reports that after winning uh, at Tapsus, he uh, made arrangements uh, in, uh, in Numidian and he went aboard his fleet at Utica on June 13, arrived two days later at Caralis in Sardinia, then he embarked on June 27th and leaving Caralis sailed along the coast. 
27 days later, for bad weather kept holding him up in the various ports, he arrived at the city of Rome. Uh, what is crucial for the purpose of this paper is the mention that uh, he, that Caesar, did not sail straight away to Italy after having reached Caralis, but sailed upwards on the coast. Uh, unfortunately for us, it is not mentioned where Caesar stopped, what the different ports, the way he has to stop uh, where. Um, so the, the very final stretch of the, the court the, or the route is um, up to our reconstruction, but this is pretty much what I propose to do in, uh, in my paper. The reasons for this are mainly to, uh, if from Caralis that is here, you say northwards up to the coast of Sardinia and Corsica, then you cross the Tyrrhenian Sea where the island uh, Elba is and then sail south eastwards, eastwards. You have two main advantages. The first one is that what you do is cabotage sailing. That is, you navigate always with land in sight. The second advantage is that the prevailing winds on this side of the Tyrrhenian Sea to the east of Sardinia and Corsica blow from the northwest and from the west. So if you cross the Tyrrhenian Sea in, in this spot and then sail south eastwards, you have the advantage of being able to exploit fully uh, the regime of prevailing winds. While if you sail from Caralis to Ostia straight away, First of all, you do not have the security of navigating with land in sight throughout your journey. And second, uh, you incur in the danger of prevailing winds from the Northwest that can be lethal uh, to any navigation. Uh, the green route that I marked on this map suggests to us another possible route that linked Africa to Italy, namely, uh, that the one that involved crossing uh, the sea roughly here, uh, uh, reaching Lilibeum and then sailing all along the coast of Sicily and southern Italy to reach, uh, to reach Ostia here. This was probably the route that was followed by the grain fleet uh, up until the construction of uh, Portus, because this is where Puteoli is, but has... Uh, Two main, two main disadvantages, one of which we have already mentioned, that is the fact that prevailing winds come from the northwest. The second of which is the fact that this stretch of coast, sorry, this stretch of coast uh, lacks natural harbors almost completely. And in fact, the first natural harbor that one encounters is Puteoli. We now move on to the final section of my paper uh, that is the evidence we have for Trajan's and for the state involvement uh, in the support of grain trade uh, in the archaeological record. Uh, as I was going through the evidence uh, necessary for my, my PhD research, I came across a relatively coherent set of imperial residences uh, rather villas, perhaps, on the coast of northern Latvia and southern Tuscany that have uh, three characteristics in common. Uh, the first one, they uh, have, they all underwent substantial building activities uh, under Trajan. And in the case of Kentum Kelle, uh, it was built under Trajan. Second, they lay on the final stretch of the route we have just been discussing. And third, the harbors facilities that they have, and this applies in particular to Portus, uh, Kentunkele, and Cosa, are absolutely huge compared to the size of ports connected to privately owned maritime villas in the Republican period and to the general needs of um, maritime villas in earlier phases. This is uh, to give you an idea uh, the size of Cosa. Uh, Cosa is here to the south of the Argentario promontory. This is uh, the complexity and 
uh, the level of facilities that the port was connected to Cosa had. Not only is it quite big, uh, about two hectares uh, overall, but it has a number of structures and facilities connected to its actual functioning. So uh, these area connected to both service, uh, kilns connected with the production of amphorae, uh, the portus is itself quite elaborate. Uh, the, the area is made safer with the construction of this breakwater. We have evidence that there is investment. Uh, the portals, this, this configuration of the Portus Cosanos uh, dates back to Republican times, but the main phase of expansion of the area, uh, of the villa in particular, is uh, connected to the uh, Trajanic period. It is uh, interesting to look at how articulated and how developed the, uh, the facade, the maritime facade of the Tyrrhenian was in the late Republican imperial times. We can see uh, uh, a, a, a surprising affluences of maritime villas all around the coast, uh, both privately owned and imperially owned, that acted not only as uh, luxurious uh, estates uh, or um, estate, uh, seaside estates for uh, for leisure, but had a crucial importance uh, in the commercial framework of the Louis Republican and Imperial times, namely with a uh, an absolutely felicitous expression with, uh, of uh, Peregrine Horde and, and Nicolas Purcell, maritime villas were gateway settlements between the land and the sea in the sense that they could funnel both goods and people landwards as well as seawards. This is not peculiar of imperial times. This is something for which we have massive evidence uh, as early as the late Republic, but it is a function of maritime villas that did not escape the imperial authority when uh, uh, the, the grain supply and the grain door needed to be organized. Why? Maybe the, the concentration of villas is more evident in two areas. First, in the area that is under examination in this paper, that is to the north of Rome, and second, to the south of Anzio and to the north of Puteoli. If these villas all have large building phases uh, in the Julio-Claudian period, these villas here have large building phases in the Tetradranic period. So what it seems to me is that this system was meant at uh, solving the problem of the harbors, uh, harborlessness of this stretch of the coast, whether these are the system here served the opposite problems, that is the harborlessness of this other stretch of the coast. Together, combined together, the maritime villas, the ports, uh, the port facilities in Rome and the port facilities in Portus created a polyfocal hub. Uh, I hope uh, you will forgive me here for stealing uh, Simon Key's words that supported grain transport. Um, why do we argue that these villas uh, gave, su gave support to grain transport? It is mainly because the number of ships that reached Rome in uh, the sailing season as part of the transport of grain was beyond the capacity of Portus and beyond the capacity of Puteoli. Uh, no matter how, uh, how big these harbors were and how developed their facilities were. And as a result, a system of secondary and even sometimes tertiary harbors was created where cargo ships could find shelter or could stop or could uh, spend some time on their way to Portus. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned the pools of different capacity. I mentioned uh, pools of different importance. Uh, and this probably, uh, can be combined together to define 
a hierarchy of force. This force were organized, was probably organized uh, hierarchically to uh, ensure the, the safe and the efficient transport of all the goods to Rome. This uh, has been explored in further detail in a number of papers from uh, a, a conference held about 10 years ago. The hierarchical organization of ports is uh, definitely connected to the necessity of ensuring an efficient, a flawless, a seamless transport of the grain. Uh, what is interesting is that the expansion of the port system in Etruria is uh, probably both a consequence of the construction of portus, uh, but we may see it as a consequence, probably because we are biased by the difference in the archeological evidence. Probably it was not just a consequence of the construction of portus, but was part of a coherent and, uh, and coherently planned system of ports uh, that were Trajan's ultimate contribution to the final organization and structuring of the grain supply. Uh, as I mentioned before, a system of minor ports is attested on the coast of, on the coast of Southern Latium, and they all date to the Julia Claudian period, while the system of ports on the northern coast of Latium date to the Trajanic period. So what I argue is that these uh, served to support the grain trade that followed the route from Sardinia, whilst these ones served to support the grain trade that followed the route from uh, Puteoli. And it's particularly interesting to note that the distance between uh, the um, distance as the bird flies between Kentunkella and Portus and Portus and Antium is roughly the same. So if we want to think about it as a hierarchical system, we can look at Portus and at the port landscape of Rome as grade one, uh, Kentuncella and Antium being grade two and the other smaller ports being grade three of uh, this hierarchy. Uh, the fact that all the ports that I looked are all connected to imperial villas provide evidence for the remarkable state involvement in the uh, coordination of these works uh, that were ultimately connected to the necessity of supplying grain. Uh, thus, uh, if we want to sum up and offer some final thoughts about uh, the evidence, the, the amount of evidence that I have presented that is uh, fair, uh, far from complete and far from uh, exclusive, uh, if it was felt uh, by the Roman authorities as a, a responsibility to ensure a constant grain supply and a reliable storage of grain, we cannot argue that uh, the state control uh, has uh, ever acquired uh, the traits of uh, Soviet Russia or, or uh, any uh, remarkably communist state of the 20th centuries. And instead, the trait that is acquired was rather in the form of the organization of uh, a huge harbor infrastructure that was aimed at supporting the Anona. Um, so the, if, if we may, what the Roman state did was rather defining uh, the background into which all the actors that participated in the Anona could play their role. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I want to thank uh, Alicia for what I think is the clearest uh, exposition I've certainly ever heard of the Roman corn supply, um, and then for going on to provide what seems to me at least to be a, a compelling argument regarding your um, clockwise Tyrrhenian uh, travel, and then uh, especially this, this, this really interesting villa argument. Now, there's all sorts of uh, fascinating topics that have come up here, and uh, I imagine there's there's some experts involved uh, online and uh, in the audience as well. The first thing that struck me in general terms was um, th th this uh, quite well-known link between unrest and food supply, uh, and also how um, these threats can drive uh, technological 
and administrative progress, uh, as you described. And it, I suppose it all depends on the famous saying, uh, I think it's the early 20th century, that all civilization is six meals, or is it nine meals away from collapse? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's something that, that makes one wonder how much uh, we could get from the questions of the modern uh, uh, global food supply uh, to help us in these things. I mean, uh, up until the Ukrainian war, we probably didn't know anything about how the modern uh, food supply worked. Um, and I imagine there must be parallels as well. Uh, when I was in Istanbul, they never stopped talking about this possibility of building a new canal from the Black Sea all the way to the Marmara, which would have been a, a really monstrous fossa. Never garbless. But uh, anyway, before I keep on rambling, I'd just like to start off with one question, which uh, doesn't really relate necessarily to the grain supply. Um, I was wondering uh, your knowledge of the archaeology of these uh, maritime villas, especially the ones uh, belonging to the Trajanic period. Do you think all of them relate to uh, the, the grain supply, or do you think there's certain ones that, that specialize in maybe grain storage and others in oil or um, wine or, or something else? Or do you think it all depends on? Uh, on the state and owner uh, regarding grain? Uh, the supply of oil and wine uh, was, was introduced later yeah. is in the severe and in later period. So if it was Trajan's concern to support the supply, what he had in mind was primarily grain, I think. And, and do, 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 does the evidence from the villas, any archaeological evidence sort of point to the fact that they're specifically geared towards storing grain rather than... Uh, not that I know of. What I know, though, is that um, research has been carried out in where in the warehouses at Ostian Portus uh, with uh, trying to define uh, what warehouses were used for based on their layout. Uh, but the answer so is unfortunately there's no way at all to tell the staple from the configuration of the warehouse. So I don't think that there is also any way in which we can infer what sort of staple was was stored in the the course under consideration from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, this when it comes to Anona, because uh, yeah. if. Yeah, can we have a question from uh, Edward? Um, well, start with Edward and then move on. Uh, hi, thanks, Alice, and thanks for helping out on the uh, City of Rome course this year. Um, so, you talked a lot about the uh, imperial investment in Portus and in importing infrastructure. Uh, I wonder, is there similar evidence in Tunisia for increased investment in ports and uh, exporting infrastructure for moving grain from Africa to Italy? Uh, not on the ports. Uh, what we do know is that uh, imperial initiatives were primarily geared towards land acquisition. Uh, this happened uh, as early as Nero, if we were to believe the remark on the uh, acquisition of half of Africa, uh, continued uh, in the Flavian period. Uh, under Nerva, there's evidence for the foundation of at least two colonies in Numidia, and the foundation of colonies was aimed uh, at increasing the agricultural potential of a territory, as we discussed with regards to the, the whole Central Asian grid. Uh, but not, not that I know, not on the ports. Uh, what it is not impossible, though, is that the, um, the growth of the port landscape and of the overall infrastructure prompted the development of other ports out of local initiative. So uh, the port, I, I, I haven't checked the issue in detail, and I apologize for this, uh, but if, for instance, the port of Iporegius growth uh, grew in the uh, Trajanic slash Hadrianic period, uh, this cannot immediately be connected with imperial initiative, but can also be the result of local initiative to increase the shipment capacity of that port. And of course, the, the commercial life of the area. Uh, of course, commercial cities are much more florid, much wealthier than any other um, any other center. So uh, traf lots of traffic prompts investment, lots of traffic prompts movement of people, and, and therefore the locals are uh, absolutely encouraged and prompted to invest in the port. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Lisa. Lisa. Thanks, Alicia. It's very convincing. Um, on the ports, Carthage has 
this massive great jetty that goes on for miles um, uh, right along the waterfront that Henry Hurst proposed in the SEAC conference. Mm -hmm. It's online anyway. Um, Koza was of course a wine exporting port, but in pre-imperial times. So all those, those things that are on the picture together of the amphora kilns and the amphora warehouses are much earlier than the imperial port. But my question is, okay, I, the clockwise navigation is just so convincing. And I've, I've never seen it better put than on that slide. Um, apart from anything else, I've shown that the return cargoes of African red slipware seem to come from Rome to Sicily rather than um, directly from Africa. I mean, it, and this makes sense of that. But what is Antium doing if the grain's already unloaded at Puteoli? So why are the boats needing to go towards Rome and, and stop at Antium? Uh, I don't think that the grain was unloaded at Puteoli because it had to reach Rome anyway. It could, I mean, uh, speaking in, uh, in, in the reign of uh, fantasy, it could have been unloaded at Puteoli if Nero had had the chance to dug the Navigabilis Fossa and transport that would be used to transport all the grain from Puteoli to Rome. I but, thought it came in carts. I thought that the, yeah, the it, final it, it, stretch well, it, was Puteoli, Rome. And yeah, yeah it, it, uh, of course, I'm, I'm talking about a seaborne transport. Uh, if, if, if carts were used, carts were used, but transport by sea is anyway more convenient than transport by land. So if transport by land could be avoided, uh, uh, states and, and authorities initiatives seem to have gone in this direction, I think. And Antium, what was it doing? Uh, Nero's involvement, I think, is uh, symptomatic of a concern towards the enhancement of the poor system to the south of Latium. So maybe cargos were unloaded at Puteoli, but not all of them. Uh, those who could not find space in Puteoli uh, could sail northwards and find space for unloading in, in uh, Terracina, Anzium, in Turne. There were loads that were all some way somehow connected to imperial initiative or imperial possessions. Okay. Um. We did have a question online a minute ago, but perhaps we could find it again. But in the meantime, uh, question yeah, thank you. the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, mine is just a curiosity, but also a subtle way to play uh, devil's advocate in this case, because you claimed that this old system is uh, implies a very strong presence and proaction of the state, especially in imperial time. But you also mentioned at a certain point the fact that I don't remember if that was specific to a certain chronology, the late Republic or uh, the Empire. Uh, the attempt to involve uh, other actors, private actors in this uh, uh, integrating and implementing this system. So I wonder if you have some more words and details on, on that, on that kind of provisions. On private uh, actors. Yes, and also if this aspect of, of trying to integrate and involve private actors uh, is also something is not only for, for the, tri the trips between Africa and, and Italy, but also in the management, in the facilities, in the arbors, uh, private estates, and so on and so forth. So That's an interesting question because, uh, of course, not all the villas we are looking at were imperial possessions, and therefore, chances are that uh, privately owned ones could have been involved in this network. Uh, this, I don't think there's much evidence for this in this regard. Um, speaking about the involvement of private individuals, uh, in Republican times, we have evidence, for example, when uh, when Sicily became a province, when Sicily became a province, uh, the collection of uh, the, the grain was uh, una decima tithe. It, it was sort of contracted to people that have uh, that played a role similar to uh, publicani, to the tax farmers. 
uh, they were not publicani uh, because they, the, they did not have uh, the, the overall uh, system was not organized in the same way as for the publicani. This is discussed in detail by, by uh, Budin Serks that uh, wrote a legally uh, oriented book on all these things. Uh, but this is, was quite uh, this was quite, was quite substantial in how it was organized by the Roman state and how uh, how heavily the Roman state resorted on private individuals. We don't really know why. Uh, Rome never had a uh, a mercantile navy. Uh, they did have a an army, the, a military navy, but that was uh, quite abandoned when. Uh, the necessity of uh, having a navy uh, declined. Uh, but uh, as far as we know, there is no evidence for attempts to create a commercial marine. So the actors, the private actors that could be part of this system could play a, a number of roles, most of which were connected to the transport. Um, of course, uh, transporting goods on the sea was a risky business. So uh, what the Roman state did to compensate uh, all these this private merchants in case of losses was, first of all, uh, granting exemptions from the public munera, but also promising uh, financial compensations in case of cargo loss. So all these uh, private merchants did have reasons to be involved in, in this framework. Um, with regard to managing course warehouses, we uh, we have no evidence. There is uh, some evidence, but much smaller um, concern with the the river transport. Uh, there are corpora, uh, the corpora caudi of the of the caudicari, that are those in charge of uh, running the naves caudicaria. So the the ships that were towed. Uh, upstream on the, the, the Tiber course to Rome. Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question from uh, Luke Redman online and, and, then, and then one from Steve. But uh, from Luke Redman, he asks, was the grain discharged at the smaller ports and villas for on carriage to Rome by land or were they used as shelter points before sailing on in the same uh, or transshipment ships to porters? This connects to Lisa's question in a way. Uh, we don't know. It's it's hard to answer this question because the only uh, we would have two main bodies of evidence for this. The first one would be literary sources, which we don't have. The second one could be uh, shipwrecks, uh, but we should always, I think, be wary about using shipwrecks as evidence for the reconstruction of sea routes because shipwrecks are failures. So uh, shipwrecks are what should not supposed to <laughs> what was not supposed to happen. So uh, it's hard to tell what happened at the small ports. Uh, my main argument is that uh, they served primarily to provide additional uh, anchorage space or wharfing space uh, for the ships that were on the route to Portus but had not reached Portus yet. We know from uh, I think Seneca that the the fleet in charge of transporting the grain from Alexandria to Puteoli could wait months uh, on, uh, off offshore, looking at Puteoli for the permission to unload the cargo, for the, the permission to uh, to sail back to Alexandria. So we, uh, I think that this one of the reasons why these ports were cre created was to. Uh, gave logistic support to uh, all these uh, secondary sides of the overall process of grain transport. Have I answered the question? Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, last question from uh, Steve. Uh, Thanks for uh, thank you, Alicia. That, like um, Lisa, I find the, um, the the roots up there very convincing. Um, I think my question more revolves around the major ports because obviously we're dealing with, as you do discuss, importers itself and their need to bring those ships in and to unload them for them for the subsequent movement of the goods. So clearly you're requiring a huge infrastructure and very deep ports as well to be able to feed those that grain fleet which is coming through. And I, 
to my mind, certainly on some of that routes, I don't. There's not many of them. I mean, certainly, obviously, in the south, then potentially Olbia to the north, although that was again slightly military. But um, I, I think I struggle a little bit to see where those major ports are, which which they're stopping at, because there simply there clearly isn't what we what we've seen the kind of the infrastructure to service them in some senses. I think for me is the is actually I I I like the idea of these secondary ports. Because they that they're, that they're serving perhaps a sm a different not certainly not a grain fleet but another kind of trade of materials of goods of perhaps we have a very strong pattern coming out in the in, in the south of uh, particularly in the south of Latu and um, the the kind of the produce coming from there I'm not sure how much produce is coming from or how much need there is coming from that strip of kind of the more northern Etrurian area that I, I find it, I struggle to see how these kind of um, maritime villas are fitting into that network in some senses. But um, I think probably the, 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 the struggle we have, and I certainly we had um, with some of our work is that because they're on the coast, Sometimes they're not difficult. They're really difficult to find now. These ports. I'm. I remember working also um, Kuma as well, which has a apparently has a huge harbour. Uh, we can't find it though. Um, it has a, um, then at um, Piergia as well is meant to have a harbour on the northern side, and we can't find it. I mean, these harbours are there, and again, porters were slightly lucky because it's now inland, and we can do with the kind of the work of Simon's work we showed that we can map it all. But um. And certainly, and then thinking all, maybe of also of Neapolis and places like that, we just can't see them. We can't find the data anymore. So it's a huge challenge, and I but it's fascinating. And I, I really like the kind of the pattern of movements around it. I think my I think my questions is probably more around the the grain fleets. I think it needs such a strong infrastructure, um, as we well, hence the need for um the the harbor, the Trojanga harbor, and things like that as well. But um, yeah, thank you very much. It was more more of a comment, I suppose. Yeah, I don't have an answer. <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, Alice has deserved a, a well-earned uh, rest and a drink. Um, so uh, we'll thank her for this uh, fascinating and original talk, which has also served the ideal uh, introduction to our visit tomorrow to Ostia. So thank you very much, Alice.